This is Robert Kraft, and I'm your host on Planet Microcap Podcast. And joining me right now is a very special guest. It is Alex Rubelkava. He is the managing partner and co-founder of Stage Venture Partners. Uh, he started his career as an analyst at Anthem Venture Partners, a leading venture capital firm in Santa Monica. Uh, after Anthem, Alex spent nearly a decade managing capital in public markets. Uh, I invited Alex on today because I wanted to better understand portfolio management in venture capital. So today's VC day. Let's do it. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be your, uh, your first uh, VC on the show and to talk about all of the wonderful things about investing in private growing startups. Well, look, my original idea for a VC show was to do like kind of a ringer podcast rewatchables of Silicon Valley, but I think this is the, ne- I think this is the next best thing. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Well, to start off, let, let's get your background. You know, uh, I, I went through that a little bit at the beginning, but I'm really curious as to where your passion for investing began. Yeah, so I started investing uh, while I was in college about 20 years ago and um, also basically stumbled into uh, a job in VC as an intern uh, 20 years ago, almost exactly 20 years ago as we speak in June of uh 2020, I was interning for a dot-com company that summer, which was one of the cohort of early dot-coms that was uh, failing as the NASDAQ had peaked a few months before and uh, the air had gone out of the first bubble there. And uh, they had nothing for me to do. It was a totally boring summer. I would, uh, you know, go around and do stuff for an hour and then they would uh, not have anything more for me to do. So I would day trade until the market closed at 1 p.m. because I was young and didn't know very much at the time. And then the market would be closed from one to 5.30 when I was supposed to leave. And so I would read the internet and you know the internet was a lot smaller back then. So I read most of it. Uh, and that was a waste of my summer. So I decided to try to talk my way over to something else or take my little $250 intern stipend check that I was gonna get at the end of June and buy a surfboard and learn how to surf because that would be a better use of my time than uh, droning on in this Dilbert cubicle doing nothing in reading the internet from beginning to end. And uh, four days before my self-imposed deadline, I somehow talked my way from this dying.com to one of the venture firms that had backed them. And I started there after the 4th of July uh, that summer. And within about a week, I was, I was just thinking to myself, this is the most interesting job I've ever had. This is the most interesting experience I've ever had. And I have been an investor ever since. Got it. So, I mean, well, hold on. I got to quickly follow up. Have you continued with surfing? I, I mean, that's the most important thing I've heard thus not, far. Not this, really. I, I, I do it occasionally, but I wouldn't say I am a surfer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, that's a very, you know, that's a, a very important distinction. And I, you know, and I, I, I'm not good enough to claim that I am, you know, truly good at it. Well, where'd you, where'd you learn? I'm, I'm a surfer myself. So I have to ask, you know, where did you learn? Uh, just around here a little bit trips to Hawaii, stuff like that. Just, you know, easy places to learn. Nice. So yeah, it's one of these things where like, it's on my list of if I ever have more time and, you know, I aspire to have more time one of these days uh, to, uh, to learn more of. I, I live a mile from the beach here in uh, LA near Venice Beach. And uh, so, you know, I really should be better at it than I am. Don't worry, dude. We'll get out there very soon. Okay. You know, I'll take <laughs> it, I'll take you to much better spots than Venice Beach. That is... I, uh, yeah, of course. I was, uh, it's funny, on a trip to San Diego a couple of years ago, I was uh, doing some stand-up paddleboarding in the bay there, and I, I was legitimately struggling with balance, um, and I kept falling over, and I happen to be an excellent swimmer, so I, I am never in any danger when I'm in the water, uh, but I kept falling over so many damn times that the Harbor Patrol kept coming over trying to rescue me. And I'm like, guys, I don't need to be rescued. I'm actually able <laughs> in the water than I am up on this damn paddleboard. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's so funny. So, yeah. so, okay. So I want to go back to your, to your, your experience there. I mean, you know, even prior to kind of, as you said, you kind of fell into it. I mean, even when you were a kid going through college, I mean, did you have a, I don't know, a, a draw, nope. did anything, nothing, nothing at no, all? Not at all. Uh, didn't know investors growing up, didn't know about a career like that. Uh, you know, my, my folks were attorneys uh, before they retired. And so they're, you know, mostly people I knew were attorneys, you know, and a few doctors. And uh, so I was not aware of this world. I wasn't aware of this, uh, 
industry or this career and uh, really truly fell into it um, and uh, ran with it once I discovered it. Cool. What, what would you say was your first investing book that you, that you read? I mean, just curious. Oh, I mean, I remember I read Lowenstein's biography of Buffett when I was in college and I dismissed it. Um, you know, I remember some of the passages in that book where you could ask Buffett what was the depreciation and amortization line on the third quarter 10Q for IBM in 1984. And he could tell you that. Like he, he actually remembers things like that. And I, you know, I have a decent memory, but I can't do that. Um, and so I kind of dismissed the success of Buffett as being attributable to his, you know, inhuman recall of numbers, um, which, which I just don't have. Uh, and it was only a few years later after I had graduated from college and was working as an analyst at Anthem, uh, my first job out of school, that uh, I was reading The Super Investors of Graham and Doddsville. And I had done some work at uh, ad agencies and media buying companies when I was in school and was not particularly impressed by that industry with no disrespect to you know, people in that industry, but I guess I just wasn't working at the right shops. Um, and in the super investor speech, Buffett talks about the guy who was in his building and would ride the elevator with him and grab lunch with him occasionally and finally asked him, well, what is it that you do, Mr. Buffett? And he learned about it and said, well, I'm in the wrong business. And he quit the advertising business and he set up a value oriented uh, fund and put up 25% annual returns for 15 or 20 years. And I thought, you know, if an advertising guy can do that, I might be able to do that. <laughs> That is, oh, that's, that's, that's. I mean, that, that was literally what was going through my mind. I knew exactly where I was. I was on a flight to Tampa Bay when I read that working on a deal that was over there. And I mean, I'm just reading this flight on Tampa Bay or, re, you know, reading this uh, speech on the flight to Tampa Bay and having my head explode that an advertising guy can make 25% a year. <laughs> <laughs> like, just, like, you know, I mean, it's easier said than done, right? But at the same sure. time, but it's, but, but, you know, look at that, you know, when we're, when we're young and dumb at that point, we think the world is our oyster, you know, yeah. well, so 25%, screw that. I'm going to make, I'm going to make 40%. 50%. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, that's funny. So, okay. So you actually alluded to what my next question was is, you know, um, and again, talked about your background, but I want to really get the full picture, you know, from, you know, graduating college and then getting to where you're at today. So what led yeah. you to each, each step along the way? Yeah, so basically I've always had one foot in the public markets and one foot in the world of startups. And so I started my career as an analyst at a venture firm here in Santa Monica, one of the oldest firms in the Southern California market. You know, while I was there, the partners at the firm were investing in some really deeply technical companies. Our bread and butter was semiconductors, um, networking equipment, things like that. But we also, in consumer, were Series A investors in companies like TrueCar and MySpace and Android. You know, I'm, I'm 23 years old. I'm, su I'm supporting the partners on the deals. I'm doing the diligence. I'm writing the investment memos, um, researching competition, doing all that kind of stuff, sort of learning the craft of investing by doing. And then, of course, you know, in the nights and weekends, I'm saving my meager little analyst salary and putting it to work in the stock market and you know reading a lot of the books about value investing and quality investing all the stuff all the stuff that all your readers are familiar with and i started investing and you know it just I, mean, I was young i was inexperienced and i was also very lucky to start investing just as the market was bottoming after 3 years of working off the dot com boom and there were just incredible bargains everywhere and I found a number of them and I put up lights out performance. And so bet between that and making some angel investments into some of the startups that my firm was working in, by the time I was like 25 or 26, I had enough money to not really need to work for the rest of my 20s. Uh, and it you know, helped being young and single and having no obligations of any material sort, you know, that's a good time to take a risk. And I was in a position where I had some runway and I had low costs and I had the ability to take a risk. And so I said, oh, I'll just go ahead and try to raise the fund and do some investing in the public markets. So I did that, did that for a number of years, did some angel investing along the side, 
uh, very occasionally, not really actively looking for it. Um, and if you fast forward six or seven years, you get to you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, I started having exits in my angel portfolio. And it started presenting me with an embarrassing problem. And the embarrassing problem was that I was doing pretty okay at my day job. You know, wasn't lighting the world on fire, wasn't you know, embarrassing myself either. Uh, but I was doing lights out. Just me lights out in my angel investing. And as the exits piled up, it became kind of hard to ignore that the world was trying to tell me something. And so I said, you know what? It's time to go back to VC. And so I uh, wound down my prior work um, and my prior firm and I uh, started up stage in 2015. And here we are. Perfect. So I, I'd want to learn a little bit more about uh, stage venture partners invest, investment philosophy. You know, how have you been able to take all of that experience and now formulate it into what you guys are doing today? Yeah, absolutely. So what Stage Venture Partners does is we are investing in enterprise software startups that are solving hard problems that matter for big companies. So we only invest at the seed stage. What seed means is that it is a company that is usually anywhere from three to eight people. It usually is just a year or two old. It's raised less than a million bucks from friends and family and angels and accelerators like Y Combinator or Techstars prior to when I get involved with the company. And then they're looking to raise their first round of anywhere from one to three million bucks to grow the team, last them 18 to 24 months, and then get to a Series A. Um, and so I invest in those kind of companies. Again, I'm only doing enterprise software. Uh, so I'm investing in companies that are building usually vertical oriented medium and larger size businesses to solve really, really hard technical problems. I like hard technical problems because it eliminates competition risk often. And if you can get over the hurdle of solving a problem with software that has never been solved with software before, you can then deliver a lot of value to customers and not have to worry about everybody in the world coming and copying what you have built. And I'm, I'm really looking for companies that exhibit those kind of characteristics. You know, if you were to think of this in a long, short kind of way, I'm trying to be long product development risk. I'm trying to be long technology risk. I'm trying to be long new market risk. And I'm trying to be short commodification risk. And I'm trying to be short competition risk. And I try to express that long short orientation in the investments that I make. So for your thesis, I mean, you, you see the greatest moat in working with companies that are really, it's enterprise software, big problems that, that I think you said, because you cut out for a split second, that small to medium sized businesses need to run their, their businesses, basically. The medium, the medium to large size businesses. Medium to large. Okay, that's where you cut out. Okay. Need to run their businesses. And so I, I tend to focus on you know, I have a cohort of companies that charge anywhere from ten to forty thousand dollars a year for their software products, and then I have a cohort of companies that charge a hundred thousand dollars and up uh, for their software. And so, you know, software at those kind of prices is evaluated carefully, it is bought carefully, it is sold with a lot of consultation, and it is the kind of thing that ends up being a system of record or a system of engagement or a system of intelligence for the customers. And they become, uh, it becomes in integrated into their business in such a way that it is core to running their business. Okay, so this, I, I, this is a standard for me. I always ask at least three to four dumb questions uh, per interview. So here's, here's the first one. Um, in terms of looking at your portfolio, because some people might think, okay, he's only focused on enterprise software, but is there ever overlap in some of the companies that are within your portfolio? Or when you're looking to bring on a company that's developing software for enterprise, are you looking at ones that have different, that are attacking different verticals? Now, how, how do you think about that? Yes. Yeah, so even though I focus on enterprise software at the seed stage, and I only invest in expensive application layer or middleware and vertical oriented products, 
I am not thesis driven when it comes to a sector. So it's not like I, you know, lock myself in a room with a whiteboard once a quarter and then emerge in a flash of insight from the whiteboard and say, this quarter I'm doing insurance tech. You know, that, that, that's not really how, how it works. Instead, I'm just out there trying to meet as many founders as I can to see as many products being built as I can and to think of myself in my diligence process, which of these feels like the kinds of problems that I am equipped to help them solve, which feel like the kinds of investments that I think can generate the return profile that's necessary for my fund and my portfolio model. Um, in practice, there are a few areas that I have invested in over and over again. Um, I've done a lot in defense and aerospace related software companies. I've done a lot in industrials and manufacturing. I've done a lot in healthcare and life sciences software. Uh, and I've done uh, a lot more than any other sector in tools for e-commerce merchants. And over time, you know, I will probably develop new practice areas and new concentration areas every year or two as I continue to make new investments and to push at the frontiers of my circle of competence. Got it. So, you know, this question, it's more or less, I guess we can ask any investor for almost any asset class, but especially with VC and, and especially with micro and nano caps, you know, and I have to ask about your, when you're going through your process of, you know, onboarding or, or bringing in a new company to the portfolio and looking at doing various seed investments, you know, how much weight do you give to the, the founder, you know, management team that's, that's was right there, you know, they might be the designer of the software, you know, uh, yep. what, 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 how much weight do you give to that knowing how long it takes and what yeah, it takes is, to take it to exit? Ass assessing the founder is the most important thing that I do. And it's the most important driver to the investment that I make because at the stage of investment that I come in, there's often little else, you know, there are, just a handful of early customers, revenue is de minimis or zero. There are no existing assets. There are no existing operations. There's no defensibility of anything yet established. It's all, I mean, it's all brand new. And the questions I'm asking are all about the founder. And the questions I'm asking are deceptively simple questions when looking at a founder. And so when I think about assessing founders and I think about the risks, the people-oriented risks in an early stage startup, there's three really simple questions that matter more than anything else. They are, can you ship, can you sell, and can you hire? And so can you ship is a question of, can you ship software? Can you get something out the door quickly and inexpensively in a workable and usable way that drives, that drives value for your customers? And the magnitude of the difference in shipping ability among early stage founders is astonishing. Um, I have often been pitched very similar ideas from two different teams where one team has spent $4 million and has not been able to get a product out the door yet in a workable condition. And another team has spent $40,000 and has gotten the product out the door and is in the hands of 10 customers who are happily and busily using it, at, you know, as I'm speaking with them. And that's such a massive difference to think about like $40,000 versus 4 million. I mean, 100 to 1. And yet I see that 100 to 1 difference all the time. So that's, you know, can you ship? Can you sell is a really important question for enterprise software because enterprise software is almost always sold. It's, it is rarely bought, especially at the early stages, especially in new kinds of software solving problems for the first time. If someone does not know that there is software out there to solve a problem that they always have had, they are not going to seek it out. They're not going to buy it. They have to be told that it exists. They have to be convinced to be a first adopter. And there is a, again, a wide spectrum of effectiveness among early stage founders in being able to get that done. And I, you know, I always sort of ask it in kind of a funny way, which is, can you convince someone who is not your mother or your mother-in-law to buy this product from you when you are three guys and a dog 
you know, WeWork. And, you know, that, that's a hard thing to do. I guess WeWorks are closed now, so they're, they've all moved back to the garage um, with, the, with the coronavirus uh, closing offices. And then, of course, can you hire is, you know, can you convince high quality people who are making a lot of money building or selling or marketing software at the likes of Google or Microsoft or Salesforce or wherever, where their job impresses all their friends that they went to college with and impresses their family and impresses their spouse to quit that impressive job with a fancy title and a fancy company that's traded on the NASDAQ and come join you know, your band of three married people and a dog in the WeWork. And being able to convince people and recruit people at scale is another one of the key risks that a founder has. And so when I'm doing that first meeting, those are the primary things that I am looking for. So like, I'm, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm putting myself in the shoes of, an inv- of, of a founder and I'm coming to a meeting with you and I, you know, I, I, I might even know the questions you're gonna ask me, you know, and yet I'm thinking to myself, well, I mean, I, could, I can speak in hyperbole and say, you know, I, of course I'll be able to sell it. Of course I'll be able to hire people, you know, and uh, of course we'll be able to ship, like no problem, because I think most founders and, uh, you know, especially at the stage you're looking at them will say yes, yes, yes to death because they want you to be an investor in their business. So how do you then, how do you sift between the real and the, and the posers? I guess a lot of it is asking questions that are as much about the past tense as they are about the future tense. And if somebody, if somebody tells me that, of course, I'll be able to ship software, I'll be saying, well, tell me about times you have shipped software before. Uh, if somebody tells me that they can sell, tell me about what you've sold. And maybe they've done it at a prior company. Maybe they have early success at their current company. You know, there needs to be some kind of evidence that that is doable uh, and that has been done. Um, but ultimately, you know, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for people who are really uniquely credible to be building the company that they are building. They're, they're people who, are, who have some kind of world-class expertise at something. And when you're investing in an early stage startup, you don't need a well-rounded team. You don't need a, you know, them to be good at it. You don't need the founder to be good at everything. You don't need the team of co-founders to necessarily be good at everything right away. You need them to be absolutely world-class at something. And then we can build a team around them as a company grows. But oftentimes I'm investing in people who are truly world-class or unique at something in a way that it would almost be laughable for anyone else in the world to even try to attempt to build what these folks are building. And I like finding those kinds of people. Got it. And I also have to ask, excuse me, to follow up on that too is, do you sometimes know the answer to at least two out of the three of those questions before you go in? And in the sense that, you know, it's not like you're going in fresh and hearing everything from scratch. You you know what I mean? No, it's actually very rare. Um, You know, occasionally I will be sent a deck or get introduced to a founder who is famous or notable from their prior work and where I have a reasonable expectation that they will measure up well on the core questions that I care about. But the vast majority of the time, even if I'm backing a repeat founder, whatever they've started before is not a company that I, you know, might have been aware of or knew about. And and again, I the over fifty percent of the investments that I make are people who are starting a company for the first time. And you know, they may have very impressive backgrounds, but they've never started a software company before, or they may be very young. You know, I have founders who are in their forties and fifties, and I have founders who are 22 years old when I back them, um, you know, and they come from very different backgrounds. I mean, how do I assess the ability to sell and to ship and to hire for somebody who just retired from 20 years as an officer in the Air Force and is starting a geospatial data satellite, uh, geospatial satellite data company that they're pitching to me? Like, you know, I've 
that's a company I funded. Uh, it's a company called Slingshot Aerospace here in Southern California. Uh, and so I had to ask the question, you know, these people clearly have incredible technical expertise from working in signals intelligence for our Air Force, and they have security clearances that allow them to know things that I'm sure would terrify you and me. Um, but they haven't built a software company before. And so how do I assess that risk? How do I think about that? I know they're really good at some things. How transferable is that? And those are, you know, those are the questions that you have to ask to uh, make a decision about what to invest in and who to invest in. For sure. So here's another question I have for you, and it has to do with the thesis, your, your thesis of looking at companies at really at, the, at that seed stage level. And it, it's kind of analogous to what we see right now going on in small micro nano caps where, you know, a lot of investors are looking either abroad or, uh, you know, actually really just abroad because there's, there's, well, one, at least in our space, there's not as many new quality names going public earlier right. in their life cycle. Right. You know, so a lot of investors will now go to Australia or Canada or Tel Aviv or Israel or, you know, just on any other exchange to look for quality. You know, I, I envisioned that might was that part of your thought process for you when you were looking at, you know, companies at, at various stages of their life cycle and where you wanted to participate in? Because I would imagine it's so competitive in the VC space. It is and it isn't. And we'll cover those two questions separately. So let's talk about sort of quality and volume and things like that. You know, when, when I started as an investor, there were, I think, just under 10,000 publicly traded companies in the United States. And right now there's probably 3,500, you know, small to large cap companies and another few thousand micro caps. You would, you would know the numbers on the micro cap world far better than I do. What, what, what is it? The number it's, of listed OTC you know, I haven't, companies. You know what? I haven't looked recently, but I know it's, a, it's still above 10,000, but a good amount of that is, you know, pink sheet, you know, great. Right. You know. And so, I mean, there, there has clearly been a diminution in the number of public companies out there. And, you know, that can be attributable to the rise of, large private equity that can be attributed to the um, inability or unwillingness of our government to enforce antitrust, at least as we might have understood that word in the past. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. But there's only so many companies out there and there are a lot of mutual funds and a lot of hedge funds and a lot of CFAs sifting through all of that. and edge is getting harder to find um, in a sustainable basis in the public markets. And I could feel that changing over time um, during my time in the public markets. In startups, there's always new companies being founded. There's always a huge volume. Uh, I review over a thousand companies every year. Uh, and it varies a little bit. Some years it'll be more, some years it'll be less. It'll probably be, you know, only a thousand or 1100 this year because of the dislocations around COVID. Um, but the year before it was 1400 and it'll probably be back up to 14 or 1500 next year. Um, when I look at those companies, I've got one shot. I've got one shot to make a decision of, am I interested in this? Because there are only two outcomes from the companies that I look at. They are either going to fail um, and cease to exist within a few years or they are going to grow so fast that they are going to be beyond the size at which I invest in them very quickly. Um, you know, I, every once in a while, I look back at my database of startups that have pitched me and I just take a sample of a hundred or so and I look around to see if they're still around. You know, so if you look at the companies that were pitching me in 2016, for example, 90% of them are no longer around. Um, a few of them have had successful exits, uh, and that's the reason that they're no longer around. But the vast majority of companies that tried to raise seed capital that did not succeed in raising seed capital uh, ceased to operate, uh, and the founders have gone on to do other things. So I get one shot, basically. Now, I sometimes get six or nine months while a company's trying to figure things out and get ready and be big enough to, or um, show signs of progress um, along the metrics that I look for, for me to invest. So I do sometimes get plenty of time, but I really only get one shot at a decision. 
at the same time, you also asked about competition. And there are a lot of seed funds out there, but what's surprising is how little competition I would say there is where I invest. Uh, the vast majority of the investments I make, I am developing conviction first relative to other investors. And you know, I usually can't take the whole round. You know, uh, my usual investment size is 250 to 500K. And I prefer investing in companies that are raising one to $3 million so that they get enough runway. So that means if I decide to do an investment and I negotiate terms and price and everything else with a startup, we then have to go find other investors. And that's part of my job as a lead investor is to help corral the investors that are already in a discussion with a startup and say, hey, I'm taking the lead position here, but I'm a team player and I would love to have you be a part of this team. And we've got a really exciting thing to do with this company here. And a lot of it is also bringing in my people, bringing in other co-investors that I've worked with frequently. And so cross investor relations and the buildup of trust and reputation and working together is a big part of this job. And what's surprising about it is with all of that, you know, it isn't all that competitive. I rarely get in competitive situations and in other places and at other times that can be different. Um, a leading VC in San Francisco uh, said earlier this year before coronavirus struck that he had eight days, usually from a first meeting to deciding to do a deal. And I'm sure that's true. Um, in the 49 square miles of San Francisco, but here on the rest of planet Earth, it works at a somewhat different pace. I was gonna say, I mean, it, I, guess, I guess that question really also came from my own VC ignorance. You know, uh, I've joked at the beginning of our, of our, of our conversation uh, about Silicon Valley, but hey, that's informed a lot of, you know, dumb, dumb opinions like myself when it comes to VCs, because you saw that, you know, uh, they would take the deal somewhere and they wait a second and then the VC themselves would basically be working against themselves because like, why is it taking so long? Okay, we'll up the price, yep. you know, bring them yep. in, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the show is quite good and captures a lot of our industry uh, very well. But uh, yeah, at the, at the seed stage, it's it's less competitive than you would think. As you get higher in the ranks of rounds, series A, series B, series C, you have an interesting effect where there are simultaneously fewer companies that get to any of those stages. You know, only about 30% of all seed funded companies get to a series A and only about 30% of series A funded companies get to a series B. And there's a lot more money at the higher stages and it's pretty clear who the runaway companies are. And so, the competition at a series at the series B and series C level is, am I going to be the VC who gets into what everybody knows is the hot deal in this sector? Whereas at the seed level, there are so many companies and there's so much noise out there and the signs of progress are so, um, they're so incipient at that point. They're, they're so early that the activity and the competition manifests itself in different ways. I mean, is there ever a time when, you know, you were looking at a company or, and you just, you're like, I know, like this one reminds me of this high flyer that, you know, uh, eventually either got bought, skipped all the series A, B and C and just got bought out. I mean, I guess it's, this is a two part question. There's that. And then also, do you look for companies at the seed stage where you, you know that they're going to need a series A, B, or C, or are you looking for companies that, you know, even from seed might get bought out because they're such high quality? You know what? Yeah, so, um, when I write a check, my expectation for the investment is that I'm going to be an investor in that company for six or eight or 10 years. It takes a long time from being three guys and a dog in a WeWork to ringing the bell to IPO on the NASDAQ. And every time I write a check, I am writing a check on the hope that one day this company will be ringing the bell on the NASDAQ and it will be the category defining company in its sector. And it will be doing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of annual recurring revenue over time. Um, 
it takes a long time to get there. Uh, nothing about that happens overnight. It often takes a lot of capital to get there. Now, occasionally, we have some companies and industries that have less competitive intensity. And again, I like that. I try to seek those out where there's less competitive intensity, where it doesn't take as much capital to grow. And you may need to raise less money and suffer less dilution along the way. But I always model into the sort of overall pro forma model that I do for my portfolio, the assumption that there will be multiple funding rounds after mine and that I will be diluted at least 50%. So if I'm buying 10% of the, uh, a company uh, post my investment at the seed stage, I'm assuming that even if I do my pro rata and invest in the next round, that over time I'm gonna get diluted down to 5% or even lower. And I have to have the conviction that this company can get big enough that I can still make 100 times my money net of the dilution. And I will never write a check to a startup and I will never make an event if I don't think that there is a reasonable basis to expect a 100x return if this one works. And again, a lot of my companies are not going to work and I need that 100x return or more to offset all the ones that don't make money and then to generate a sufficient return for the entire portfolio to compensate my investors, my limited partners for the extreme illiquidity and the extreme risk that they take to invest in early stage startups. You know, if you are going to do something like this, if you are going to invest in a whole bunch of companies at this stage that are this young and um, illiquid and risky, you know, the, uh, the effort has got to be worth the risk. Dude, I don't know how you still have your hair. I mean, that, <laughs> that is, wow. I mean, the, 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 just the risk associated with it. I mean, it, it's. It is. But again, I, the risk I, is at the individual company level. And if you construct a portfolio well, you minimize as much as possible that risk to the portfolio. And if you then work really hard as an investor in a company, if you are an energetic and participatory board member who brings to bear everything you can to help that company succeed, you mitigate risk through your own presence as well. And so, you know, risk management and risk mitigation in the public markets is part and parcel with valuation, with business quality, with the liquidity of the public markets itself and your ability to reverse your decision every day, presuming that there is liquidity. And obviously in your audience's world of micro caps, there's less liquidity than there is in other areas. But in venture capital, there is no liquidity. Risk management for me is not, I can change my mind and sell my shares if I decide I've made a mistake. It's if something goes wrong, what am I going to do about it? How am I going to help the company to get through this problem? And do I have enough upside potential throughout the whole portfolio? And am I always taking steps to preserve and to grow that upside optionality so that the portfolio, so that each company and uh, individually and the portfolio in aggregate always has sufficient upside to properly account for the risk of what we do. That's a perfect segue because I, I wanted to ask you about uh, portfolio construction because uh, you actually one of the ways I found I found you was the interview that you did with Toby back in uh, in March, and he asked you a question about this on his podcast, and I I really thought it was an important it was important to reiterate here, and uh, you actually wrote a blog that touches on this as well called uh, the limitations of portfolio management in venture capital. So you know you touched on it already, but I want to get a full picture. You know how, how do you really think about portfolio construction? And what, what are some of those limitations? Yeah, so I mean, in, in VC, you have a series of trade-offs in portfolio management. You know, you have the trade-off between how you use your money and when. You know, the more money I put into a startup on the first day that I invest in it, the more I'm buying ownership at a low price per share that, can then be diluted over time. But 
on the day that I make my first investment in a company, no matter how much due diligence I've done on that company, no matter if I've spent months researching that company or that industry uh, or talking to customers or doing all the things that one does to build conviction in a startup, I know less about that company than I will a year from now after I've been an investor, after I've served on the board, after I have seen how the CEO and the founder has dealt with the challenges of growing a company. I, I know so much more a year later. I know more a year after that. And there is value to that information. There is value to knowing that. Now, often if a company has done well, the price of that information is that the value of the company has gone up. And if I want to put more money in, I'm paying a higher price. And there is a trade-off between those two things. And that trade-off is so subtle um, and so dependent on the types of companies that you invest in, in the personality and the preferences of the investor, that it is a question that will never be resolved. You know, it's the kind of thing where generations of rabbis can argue about the Talmud for thousands of years and never achieve an answer. And this is, that, that trade-off is one of these trade-offs that will always vex generations of rabbis and generations of VCs. Um, you know, there's a trade-off in terms of what you use your reserves for. So, you know, if I, put, if I put money into a startup and I decide I want a reserve to invest later, there are multiple causes to invest later. I might choose to invest later because they've done a big splashy series A led by a big fancy firm like Sequoia or Benchmark or someone like that. And I want to put more money into the deal because at this point I know that they're doing something really right, that they've attracted these big investors. Presumably they have lots of big customers and they've hired some really great people along the way. I'm like, I want to keep putting my, more money into my winners there. I might also have companies that struggled where it took a little, little bit longer to figure out how to sell to a customer in a way that resonates to a customer or the product turned out to be harder to build than we expected. And we need more time and money before we get the product really working in a way that resonates with a customer. Or maybe we've hired the wrong people and had to cycle through uh, a few early hires before we found the right fit to help a company grow. So the question is, you know, do I take a hardline maximalist stance and say, no, I'm not going to support the companies that have stumbled along the way. I'm only going to put it into the companies that hit ignition from the get-go. Or do I take a gray zone uh, approach and think, you know, there are reasons to believe that this company will succeed, even though they've had a little bit of a stumble along the way. And ultimately I've just, I've, decided that the decision is I should do both, both have value and that I need to have distinct pools of reserves for each of those uses and to know what I'm doing and document what I'm doing every time I allocate my reserves so that I'm honest with myself as an investor saying like, I'm using my reserves here with the knowledge that a few things need to go more right than they have to date, but with the expectation based on the diligence I've done, that we have a reasonable basis to believe that that will happen. And so, you know, that's a trade-off because every dollar that I don't, every dollar I use for a round like that isn't one that goes into the incandescent immediate winners. But at the same time, if I don't allocate the ones that are on the bubble, money to the ones that are on the bubble, fewer of those companies will figure it out and succeed and I'll have more losers in my portfolio. Whereas if I do allocate to them, I have a reasonable basis to believe that they will figure it out and then they'll turn into those incandescent winners down the line. And so the use of reserves impacts your loss ratio if you do it right. If you do it wrong, you're throwing good money after bad. And that's why that question is so vexing and that's why that is a trade-off that is also one that is as individual as an investor is and where there's no one right answer. So, you know, th there's all sorts of trade-offs like that when doing portfolio management and all of the trade-offs are implications of the fact that the investment decision is a one-way gate. You only have control of when you put money in. You really don't have control of when you get money back out. 
absolutely. Well, you know, here's, okay. I told you I was going to do dumb questions. Here's dumb question number two or three, or who knows? It could be four. Um, I mean, in thinking about portfolio construction, I mean, do you then also have kind of like a number of deals that you're like, you know, I feel comfortable doing this many deals within this fiscal year, or this many deals, you know, in this couple months or, oh shoot, I haven't done a deal in a while. I should, you know, I, I, I should go look for something. You know, how, how do you, how do you work through that process? Yeah. So, we could, you know, VCs want to have what we call time diversification. And so, you know, if we put all our money to work too quickly, we might be putting it to work at a time when valuations were high or when technology trends are such that there wasn't a lot happening that turns out to be important or transformative or where stuff out in the world just happens to go bad. You know, if I had put all of my money to work in the first and second quarter of 2019, for example, on companies with a one year runway, they would all have been running out of cash just as coronavirus descended on the world. And even though, you know, I can't anticipate something like a coronavirus or a pandemic in advance, it is easy to anticipate that from time to time, the capital markets will shut down. You know, we saw that this year with COVID, we saw that in 2008 and 2009 with the great financial crisis, and we saw that to a limited extent in the dot-com crisis. And a startup that is burning money and that needs to raise additional capital on an ongoing and infrequent basis in the future depends on the capital markets being open. So one form of diversification that's really important is I can't really have all my companies needing to raise money all at the same time. And the easiest way to mitigate that risk is to fund companies with a long enough runway, call it you know 18 months or so, and to not do everything all at the same time so that those runways are staggered in time. It's, you know, it's the VC equivalent of a bond ladder. <laughs> and, uh, and so you want time diversification for that reason. You also need to be respectful of the base rates in startups, you know, very few startups at a valuation of under $10 million pre-money, which is where I invest, ever get to a billion dollars in enterprise value. So you need enough, you need enough shots on goal to have a reasonable, ba reasonable basis to believe that you'll kick a goal. And, um, you know, in soccer, I think it's actually a decent metaphor for that because you have to take a lot of shots on goal to score a single point in soccer. Uh, so, you know, you, you need that. You know, what number that is, is again, one of these questions that is individually answered by every venture firm, some better than others. Got it. So another question that I have for you, because look, we're a micro cap show, we talk about small micro nano cap stocks, you know, how should a micro cap investor think about venture capital and startups? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, a microcap investor has, you know, kind of an interesting perspective on the VC world because they're already used to investing in small companies. And, you know, as I said, I'm investing in companies at a pre-money valuation of under 10 million. And that's, you know, that's nano cap even by microcap standards. But it, I think, should resonate with your listeners in a way that, you know, investing in a trillion dollar company like Apple or Google might not. And you know, I guess one difference that's different between startups and public microcap stocks is, again, this sort of idea of explosive upside potential, you know, where I have to be able to see a path to 100x or more in order to write a check. And even among microcaps that have the potential to go up a lot, they, very few are going to go up by that much over even a 10-year period. So there's a little bit more return potential. But there's also the issue of, you know, there are so many different companies out there. You know, the, the microcap world is a large and diverse world. The world of private startups is much larger. And there's much more opportunity for an investor who has successful fundamental, fundamental analytical skills to apply those skills in the world of startups than there is anywhere in the public markets, I believe. So Alex, I, I have to ask, and this is my favorite question I ask every guest I have on here. What would you say is an investing experience that impacted you the most in your career? 
That's interesting. What has impacted me the most? When I was at the venture firm that I started my career at, uh, Anthem, one of the last startups that we partnered with before I left that firm was Android. And we invested in Android before a single line of code had been written. The company was Andy Rubin in a PowerPoint deck at that point. And at the time, Rubin was one of the most well-known cell phone designers in the world. Um, he has since become controversial for some bad personal decisions he has made, but I think most of those bad personal decisions were long after we invested in him. We certainly were not aware of any of those things at the time. Um, but he was, a, he was the most prominent cell phone um, developer and architect in the world. He had a thesis rooted in time that was very intelligent, which was that chips were getting better, screens were getting better, bandwidth was getting better, and there was a once in a generation opportunity to create a, an operating system for cell phones. And he was uniquely capable of almost anyone in the world to be the person to do that. And we funded him on that basis. And uh, that company was subsequently sold to Google and now has 2.5 billion registered devices and subscriptions on earth. I mean, this has gone literally from one person in a PowerPoint deck to 2.5 billion users. And there are only 7 billion people on earth. So, you know, that's about the highest market share of anything. I mean, you know? I, yeah, no, that's an incredible story. I, and, and nothing, nothing that will ever scale like that. And that resonance of the, the right founder, a uniquely capable person, a unique moment in time where now was the only time that you could build that startup. That was the only moment in time where that was possible to do. And where the venture firm that I worked was uniquely capable with its experience in a lot of the semiconductors that went into cell phones and with software expertise that it had to sort of be the right fit for that particular company. That question of why you, why now, why us, I first saw in Android and I first saw the power of that. And that informs so much of what I do today, 15 years later here at stage. So, okay, I have to ask, I have to do a follow up to this question. How about, how about an experience since starting at stage that's, that's taught you the most thus far? I would say that what I have learned since starting stage that has been most surprising is that technology risk is almost always overestimated by investors in application software companies. And you would think that more of my companies would fail because they failed to build a product that seemed like a hard product to build. And in application software today, that is rarely a cause for failure for a company. Um, failure is almost always caused by a failure to find product market fit and to have good unit economics and to deliver actual value for customers. That, that by far is, is the dominant risk in early stage startups. Can the product be built for the vast majority of things is not really a question. Now, occasionally some people will come to me with, you know, harebrained, you know, pinky in the brain world domination ideas that are not actually technically possible here on planet earth in 2020. And maybe I should revisit those ideas in 2030. Um, but most of the time that's not the case. You know, if someone is pitching me, you know, scooter rental scooter rental businesses on mars i'll say that's a great business in 2040 but that's going to be a little bit challenging right now <laughs> um but absent sort of absurd examples like that most of the risk is in the team the go-to-market the pricing the capital efficiency 
and that kind of stuff. And comparatively less of the risk is, can this product actually be built? And so what that means is that you should be taking more of that risk. You should be rushing into situations where other people get a little too scared of that because they are overestimating that risk. And when you find, an o when you find a risk that is being overestimated by other investors and you believe you have a good basis to believe that you are estimating that risk better than other investors, right there, that's edge, that is alpha. Very cool. So, I mean, sorry, I, I was just thinking about how that the timing of Android, I mean, how everything just aligned perfectly. Right. Some, that is, I mean, that's, that, so, that's just, uh, it's a amazing. timing. All stories like that. Timing, timing, timing. Timing is so important in startups. Most of the best technology startups are creatures of time. You know, Intel released the 4000 series microprocessor in 1974 and 1975. Within three years, Apple, Oracle, and Microsoft were all founded to put an application layer and an operating system layer on top of the new microprocessors that were now available. It is not an accident that those three companies were as tightly rooted in time as they were. The enabling technology came out and then good software developers figured out what to do with them. Uh, Uber may be my favorite example of a startup intensely rooted in time. For Uber to succeed, for Uber to be, to be launched, you had to have smartphones, but not just smartphones, you had to have smartphones with open app stores where you did not have to go to Verizon and AT&T and beg them and bribe them to put your app on deck on the phone, which is what you used to have before there were app stores. The app store removed much of the permission that was required. Apple still you know, exercises some degree of discretion over what they allow, allow in their app store, but getting an app approved on the Apple app store is infinitely easier than getting an on-deck deal with Verizon in 2005, which was a really good way to destroy half your brain cells. Um, so you needed the smartphone, you needed the open app store, you needed GPS chips with 10 meter resolution, because before that you often had 100 or 500 meter resolution on a consumer grade GPS chip. And if your Uber is 500 meters away, that doesn't do you any good. Um, so you needed that. You needed a mapping layer that mapped all the streets in the world in software in a way that was usable via API, which cost billions of dollars. I mean, Google spent billions of dollars and gave away the API access to Google Maps for free for many years. And Uber would never have been able to launch without that and without it being free. And you needed tens of millions of people suddenly out of work who needed to make extra money. You needed all those things to happen. And the moment all those conditions existed in the world, Uber was founded. And I don't think that's an accident at all. And real quick, are you a shareholder in Uber? I am not a shareholder in Uber. Got it. So, yeah. uh, th so then uh, to follow up on that, I mean, is that why right now you're focused so much on enterprise software? Because you are seeing that there's all these different factors that May, are really going to make this industry even more robust? Is that, is that why you're focused on that space? Yeah, enterprise software is in what you might call a deployment phase right now. There's a very famous book uh, about uh, the cycles of technological innovation uh, by a, a Venezuelan economist named Carlotta Perez. And in her book, she talks about what she calls an installation phase where you have a frenzy, you have a lot of um, speculation happening and um, it often ends in some kind of an of a crash and, and interruption and then you have the deployment phase where we sort of pick up the pieces and actually use the tools that have been developed in an economically productive and somewhat rational way, uh, way. and I would argue that enterprise software in many ways is in a an extended deployment phase right now where big companies are essentially retooling the way that they do a lot of things. They are adopting this kind of technology at a pace that varies by company and by industry. There are certainly some folks who are you know, more thoughtful and aggressive. Um, 
than others. You know, a really good example is Walmart. You know, I'm a seed investor investing in companies that are super early, and it continuously surprises me how many of these five-person, one-year-old companies already have some sort of a pilot with Walmart by the time that they're coming to pitch me. And that can only exist if Walmart has a really well-developed and high volume approach to saying, yeah, we'll try this out. We'll pilot this and we'll see how it works with, I mean, it must be hundreds, if not thousands of startups a year because I see so many examples just myself. And Walmart's doing that really well. You know, other large retailers like Target or Home Depot or Sears, I don't see as much involved that early with startups. And so the pace varies, but Ultimately, the companies that do this well, that succeed at it, are going to accumulate a competitive advantage against the companies that do not. And there is a degree of, there's a degree of inevitability and there's a degree of lack of choice when it comes to, are you going to engage in this arms race or not? My favorite place to see the starkness of that choice is in e-commerce. In e-commerce, Amazon is spending, what are they going to spend this year? Like $40 billion in R&D and in CapEx, maybe 50. And every cent of that $50 billion is going to one goal. And that is to satisfy the customer needs that never change. Customers want greater selection. They want lower price and they want faster delivery at all times. Bezos has written about this repeatedly about serving the needs that do not change in his shareholder letters. He often talks about how uh, customers are divinely discontent and that when you establish a new service level, when you go from five-day super saver sh shipping to two-day prime shipping, the customers are all like, that's really cool. Can you get it to me in a day? And now Bezos is making that investment to pull in the service level from two days to one day in, um, in their deliveries. Every other retailer, must meet that service level. They have to figure out a way to do that or they will lose to Amazon. And no other company has $50 billion of R&D and CapEx to build it themselves. So they will have to adopt technology from third party vendors in order to meet the basis of competition that has been established for them, whether they want it to or not. And if they don't, they're gone. And that makes the decision to buy software kind of black and white, kind of crystal clear. And, uh, and so I like to invest in sectors like that. I like to invest in sectors where the customers have no choice but to adopt. And I like to invest in sectors where I don't need to ask questions about the total addressable market. E-commerce is big enough. So Alex, for, for those who may be thinking about starting their own VC firm or, or going to work for a VC firm, you know, what advice would you give them? So let's, let's touch on each of those separately. So going to work in a VC firm, um, there is no one path into VC. Um, and it is, um, there are so many different ways into VC that it's uh, hard to give advice. I would say that, you know, as I look to grow my team in the future, the things that I will be, that I will care about is, how much risk has a person taken in their life and in their career? And how did they deal with risks when they did not go well? You know, it is risky for limited partners to invest in a venture fund. It is illiquid and it's long time horizon for them. And they are taking a leap of faith on a risk to invest in a venture fund. The founders who are taking a risk with their career, with their personal investments, with their reputation are taking even more of a risk than anyone else involved uh, in a, startup and of course employees are taking a risk coming to work for a startup especially when they are taking a lower salary often in exchange for equity uh, to do so i don't think you can be a good vc unless you have personal experience with risk and in particular personal experience with risks that have not gone well you have to figure you have to have felt that you have to have known that that has to be part of your identity and you've then been able to get up and move on and resume taking additional risks with the greater knowledge and the greater experience that you now have to be good at this job. And somebody who went to 
a fancy Ivy League school and then went to work at Goldman Sachs and then went to another fancy Ivy League school for business school and then worked at McKinsey or Google or whatever. After that, who then wants to get into venture, I don't think is taking that kind of risk. And I don't think, you know, is a fit for that kind of thing. And if they want to do something like that, they probably need to find some way to go out there, get their hands dirty, get beaten up and bruised a little bit doing something uh, where there is real risk in order to do something like this well. Um, so that's sort of on the job seeker status, on the, on the if you want to start your own venture fund, you know, starting a venture fund is, um, it's, the, uh, it's the hardest way to make easy money that uh, you could probably come up with. There is a perception that, you know, VCs are always loaded and swimming in huge amounts of money and, uh, you know, uh, are always on a private jet somewhere. And sure, if you've been a general partner at, you know, a Sequoia or a uh, Greylock or an Excel for 20 years, you're probably at that level uh, in some way. Starting a seed venture fund where you're raising, you know, a few million bucks, five or 10 or 20 million for your first fund and 50 or 60 for your second, where your LPs expect you to put in a lot of money into the fund alongside them. And then you have to run the business and hire people and all that kind of stuff. It's the kind of thing where you should probably be prepared not to have an income for five years. And if you aren't prepared for that, you may be surprised by how long it takes and how, how long it takes to really, you know, have it turn into a business that generates sustainable income. And you should be surprised, and you should not be surprised by how long it takes to ever receive carried interest in this business. You know, if you're investing in a startup and it takes 10 years for there to be an exit, that's 10 years until you get your, your carry check. And I think that's something that surprises a lot of people who look at VC from the outside and may not understand the timetables and the risk that's involved. And then of course you have to convince other people to invest in your venture fund. And investing in a venture fund is always something that is discretionary. You know, there's no one in the world who has an urgent problem that is going to be solved by investing in some random guy or gal's venture fund. I think that's a great way to end it right there. Um, I, I, love, I love that phrase that you said, the, uh, the hardest way to make easy money. That's going to be the title of this whole thing. So, uh, so Alex, with that, where can my audience go and find more information about Stage and also to follow you on social media? Yeah, so uh, stagevp.com is uh, our website. You can go there to see the kinds of companies that we invest in and uh, visit all of our portfolio companies and see the amazing things that, they, that all of them are doing. And then um, I am uh, pretty active on Twitter and uh, my handle is at Alex Rubelkava. Well, Alex, thank you so much for, for doing this with me and, and, and taking the time to do the interview. I mean, this was, this was awesome. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Excellent. Glad to have been here.